Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Institute for International and European Affairs here in Dublin. Today's event is part of the Global Europe Project, which is supported by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. The Global Europe Project aims to analyze and communicate to the wider public the debate on the future of Europe, the EU's role in the world, and Ireland's role in the multilateral order. We are delighted to be joined today by Anna Paula Zacharias, Secretary of State for European Affairs in Portugal, who has been generous enough to take time out of her busy schedule to speak to us today about the Conference on the Future of Europe. Secretary Zacharias will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we will move into a Q&A session with our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once Secretary Zacharias has concluded her presentation. If I could please request that you identify yourself and keep your questions as brief as possible so that we can get to as many of them as, as we can during the event. I would remind you that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we are also live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Our guest speaker today is Anna Paula Zacharias, who has been Secretary of State for European Affairs in Portugal since 2017. She has had a very distinguished career as a diplomat, serving as Portugal's ambassador to Estonia and as deputy permanent representative of Portugal to the European Union. She has also served as head of the European Union delegations in Brazil and in Colombia and Ecuador. She holds a degree in cultural anthropology from the University of Lisbon. During Portugal's presidency of the Council of the European Union in the first half of 2021, which concluded just a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Zacharias served as one of three co-chairs of the executive board of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So she is in a perfect position to give us an update on the progress made in the conference to date and a first-hand impression of how the new procedures put in place for this conference are working out. Before giving the floor to Secretary Zacharias, I would like to welcome Ireland's ambassador to Portugal, Ralph Victory, who is joining us today and to invite him to say a few words. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Very much, John. Thank you very much, John and colleagues. Uh, delighted to see you all. And um, excuse me, just some technical issues here as I endeavor just to, to, to resolve those, pardon me. Um, once again, John, uh, very good to see you. And thank you to colleagues in IIEA for uh, arranging this afternoon's event. Um, a sincere welcome, uh, Kane Milifolcha, to Secretary of State Anna Paula Zacharias, who I had the pleasure, in fact, of just having a, a meeting earlier on today. And uh, John, you've given the background to Secretary of State Zacharias' uh, distinguished diplomatic career. Um, and certainly throughout the, the Portuguese EU presidency, uh, we were honoured to, to have uh, several exchanges. Uh, and I know uh, Minister of State for European Affairs uh, on the Irish side, Minister Thomas Byrne, uh, Secretary of State, always enjoyed his uh, interactions with you, uh, the various exchanges, both bilaterally and in the context of the General Affairs Council. 
So we're delighted that you're uh, in a position to join us this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, as John says, for taking time from your schedule. Um, it's been an extremely busy period for you. Uh, I know amongst the, the, the various hats that you had to wear during the presidency, uh, it involved a lot of work in the, the, the conference on the future of Europe space in your capacity as co-chair of the executive board. So looking forward to uh, an excellent event this afternoon, looking forward to hearing your insights and perspectives. And with that, John, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you again. Well, I think uh, we can thank you very much, Ambassador, for that uh, introduction, which is very welcome. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over to Secretary of State Zacharias. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ambassador John Neary. Um, pleasure to see you again, Ralph. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet with you uh, again today. And uh, um, also a pleasure to be here with all the, the participants uh, in this uh, in this uh, video conference. Um, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to interact uh, with the International European Affairs uh, Institute of Ireland to discuss on the conference on the future of Europe. And I must confess that for me, it's very interesting to be here uh, two years after I had uh, this first interaction with the, with the Institute, uh, when in 2019, I had the opportunity to discuss with you on the new strategic agenda and the future of Europe. And here we are, two years later, uh, with uh, an incredible amount of things that happened. And uh, we were talking at that moment in the age of transition, look at the transition we have had in these uh, two years. Uh, what a challenge. And uh, in a couple, in a, in a matter of months, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has brought about profound changes in our societies. Not a single person uh, in the EU was uh, being left unscanned by the COVID-19 and by its consequences. And uh, it has brought about a lot of suffering, but it was also the opportunity for positive changes. Uh, and, and we hope that these positive changes can be addressed uh, in the interest of generations to come. And it, this is important because we all know that the union has been evolving crisis after crisis, managing to, to always find ways uh, to evolve. And we had a couple of crises in the last decade. Uh, we had uh, the economic and, uh, and finance crisis. We had the migration crisis. We had Brexit. Um, we have now the pandemic and we can see that we are facing clearly also a climate change uh, uh, crisis that uh, with terrible consequences as devastating consequences that we are seeing uh, nowadays. And, um, and so the question is, are we ready to face this whole challenge, all these challenges, and how can we do this? Then we know that uh, along the years, the European Union has been adapting and uh, finding new structures, new ways of being more democratic, more better inclusive, and, um, and bringing citizens closer since the process where we had the first elections for the European Parliament uh, in 1979, uh, bits by bits, the citizens have been more and more included in the process of decision-making in terms of the uh, processes of the union. and, and uh, and here we are after a big crisis and in a moment where we really need to bring in people into the decision process. So now citizens have demonstrated that they want a more resilient, a more sustainable, a more inclusive economy to emerge from this crisis. And they want to see us better prepared to deal effectively with the common challenges that are facing all uh, Europeans. And indeed, when we uh, see the, the, um, the polls, we see that a recent uh, Eurobarometer survey revealed that 92% of respondents across all member states demand that citizens' voice are taking more into account in decisions relating to the future of Europe. So here we are. Are we ready to listen to them? Are we ready to listen to the citizens? And which citizens are we talking about? It's the bubble, 
uh, the Brussels bubble? Is it the ones that are already interested in European affairs? Uh, can we reach to the people that are living outside our big cities? Uh, can we reach to those that are normally not heard? And um, uh, it is important that uh, we look into all these elements and we try to figure out at this point um, what are the changes that we need to do in our union? What do, what do people really want? What do people want about jobs? What do people want about health? What do people want about um, changes in terms of uh, uh, climate, uh, in terms of energy, uh, in terms of uh, uh, jobs and in terms of our industry, in terms of the place of Europe in the world? And we need to also put the big question on about our values, about uh, rule of law, about democracy and uh, human rights. How are we dealing with this? So I think that at this point, it is indeed fundamental to have this conference on the future of Europe. But what is this conference? How, how, how are we going to deal with this? So far, we have managed to put it on. On the 9th of May, we started the conference on the future of Europe with very important speeches made by the three institutions, the Council, the Commission, and the European Parliament. Very relevant speeches on the future. And also with very interesting calls for the citizens to say, to have their saying. Um, and then finally, we managed to get a system that makes this conference work, um, bases on three, on five, I would say, Five P's. Let's see, the first P, it's about people. It's about people participating. So we need to find people to participate and have their say. And uh, this has to be a genuinely open, inclusive, transparent, um, structured, participatory democratic debate. Uh, underlying the crucial role of civil society so that we can bring the voice of citizens uh, to the table, to the European Union uh, table. And people are being heard in terms of, you know, their participation in the, the, the platform that has put uh, forward by the Commission, in the participation in the national panels and in the participation of the European panels. So people first, this is the first P. Then how can people participate? They can participate through a platform, a, a digital platform that is put forward by the commission that identifies nine areas where people can put forward their ideas and they can also upload events and uh, with all the relevant elements of these events and the reports that are the result of these events. All across Europe, there is no geo-blocking in the, in the platform, so everybody can participate. Um, then the third P, which is the panels. We have panels that can be launched at national level, and I know that all over, all member states have been engaging in the organization of events of different formats, in different formats, in different uh, um, ways, <clears throat> but all member states uh, are engaging in organizing events uh, where citizens can talk about the future of Europe. And then there is the European events. The European uh, panels will gather 800 citizens uh, that are chosen randomly all across Europe and that are supposed to be like a mirror of the European society as a whole. And this 800 people are supposed to gather in groups of 200 and debate four basic large topics. They are supposed to discuss on economy. They are supposed to discuss on values and democracy. The third block, it's about climate and, uh, and all the elements around climate. And the fourth block, it's about global Europe. 
So 800 people divided into groups of 200 debating these four big themes. And they will start this process right now. We, we, we have started already in June with a first meeting here in Lisbon uh, of European citizens with the first uh, group. But now they will start with all the 800 uh, in September. And uh, so September and October, there will be the first uh, um, uh, sessions uh, presentially, we hope. Then there will be a second session uh, online in November and the third session in December and January so that these 800 people can come up with concrete proposals on this very big areas of work. And uh, where all this converge, uh, the platform, all that is in the platform, all that comes from the national, uh, from the national panels, all the elements that are coming from the debates of the European citizens in these European panels will get to the plenary. And here we go for the four, the four P. The plenary uh, will gather all this information and will debate this information and the concrete proposals that are emerging uh, from all these elements. The plenary will have, well, there will be probably six plenary sessions. There was one already in June that we called the inaugural conference plenary. There will be another one in October, one in December, one in January, one in February, and possibly a last one in March to have the conclusions, the wrap up, so that the final report can be elaborated by the executive board. Who participates in this plenary? We have representatives of governments, 54 representatives of government, so two for each member state. We have national parliaments, uh, four for each member state. So 108 participants from the national uh, parliaments. We have exactly the same number of participants from the European Parliament. So 108 participants from the European Parliament and also 108 participants from the citizens. The citizens, why 108? They are 80, so 10% uh, of, the, of the 800 from the European, uh, from the European panels, then 27 uh, representatives from the national panels, and then one, which is the, uh, the young man uh, or the young lady, I think it's a lady now, that is the president of the European Youth Forum. Then we have also representatives of the commission, of course, three commissioners, then uh, committee of regions, 18, local authorities, 12, uh, social and economic committee, 18, social partners, 12, and civil society, eight. So all these people will gather to discuss the elements that come from the platform, from and from the panels. And here we go to the fifth P, which is probably the most important, which is policies. So the outcome of the plenary will turn out to be, uh, will be discussed uh, in terms of also either very concrete proposals or in terms of orientation for policies that are then fit in into the uh, system itself. So we, the executive board has to prepare a final report for the conference around the month of April, and it will be delivered to the three co-presidents, to President Sassoli, President van der Leyen, and the president of the council. At the time, the rotating presidency will be with France, so it will be handled to President Macron. It's up to them to read the report and then transform it into uh, change, into real policies uh, that uh, will make the difference and will bring us you know, into a future that um, has, uh, has been also forged and worked uh, with the citizens. This presents huge challenges, but I think I will stop here and then we will have time to discuss about the challenges that uh, this entails, because it's not 
self-evident. How are we going to bring all these elements, uh, use them to change policies, and in the end, if needed, change structures? Because if the citizens demand for a change in policy, that demand may entail a change in the structure and a change in the treaties. Uh, so uh, not an easy ride and full of challenges that uh, we need to discuss. For me, it was really very, very interesting and an honor to be part of the executive board of the, uh, of the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe. And I sincerely hope that we will be able to manage this and to use it as a very good tool because this is a tool a tool uh, to build uh, uh, Europe and uh, to build it uh, the Europe that we want, um, a Europe that listens to the citizens and is closer to the citizens. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Neary. And I, I, I now um, you know, engage with the conversation with you because it, this is all about conversation <laughs> also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Zacharias. Uh, for that very interesting and wide-ranging presentation. Um, you've given us a very good description of the organization of the conference. And I particularly like uh, the method, methodology you used of the five Ps uh, to describe the various elements of the conference and, and how they link to each other. And it is, I suppose, a novel form of organization for a European conference or a European way of considering issues. Um, and so it will take us all, I think, a little bit of time to get used to this and to get to understand how the various elements work together. So uh, we're already getting questions in uh, via uh, the Zoom function, but um, if I could ask you a couple of questions to start the discussion. Um, and the first relates to the, the last P you mentioned, the policies. Um, Based on your experience of the conference to date, what sort of outcome do you expect uh, the conference will produce? Will it be, uh, as in previous intergovernmental conferences, a very uh, defined and clear set of proposals that are ready for implementation? Or is it likely to be more, as you said, uh, policy orientations that have to be further developed before they're, they're ready for adoption. Um, and the second question is, uh, a number of the topics that are being addressed by the conference um, are already being dealt with uh, in the European institutions. We have the Commission's Green New Deal, we have the proposed Pact on um, Migration and Asylum, we have proposals for completing the single market and uh, the banking union and so on. So uh, in the light of all this work that is already going on, what added value can the Conference on the Future of Europe bring uh, in these particular areas? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This, these are very relevant questions because this is a democratic exercise. It's, a, it's an exercise that uh, you know, takes uh, all the relevant uh, elements of uh, of uh, our representative democracy, but also goes a little bit further. And the three uh, European institutions uh, work together to get closer to the citizens. So I would say that indeed, when we, it comes to climate change and the single market and, uh, and the job creation and migration, the commission is doing a lot and the, and the member states with the commission and the, with the support of the European parliament. I wonder how many people knows about this. So there is an element of awareness about the European Union and its policies that is already a very important element that we have to deal with. So the idea is to bring all this information also to people so that they can um, assess it. That's why we also have a set of experts that will support this uh, European panels of citizens in case they need some information of what is being done. And, uh, and then um, when they know what is being done, they can say, okay, this is good, this is enough, we should work on this, or they can say, no, we need to do more, uh, and we need to engage more in some sort of 
policies, because, for instance, in the social domain, uh, we see now after the pandemics that there is clearly an inequality that has been uh, the, the inequality gap that has been generated. Uh, people that lost their jobs um, might want to have different sorts of policies in there, and uh, and then. If this is the case, if people say, oh, we need something more on uh, uh, fighting unemployment or um, uh, we need to do something more in the health uh, domain, these are traditional policies that belong to the member states. If the union is going to engage in something more in health, uh, we need to see how far can this be done. So I would say, that there are two elements here, the element of listening to people, explaining to people what he's been, what he's been doing, the union, and listen, and at the same time, trying, it is very important that this doesn't redundant in a, in a populistic uh, uh, exercise, because things are complex and difficult. Things are not black and white. Uh, you, you, when you deal with climate change, you have to deal with energy, and when you deal with this, you have to deal with industry, and you have to deal with jobs, and every single thing is connected to the other. So uh, it's it's very easy to say, oh, I want this measure, and I want that measure, but we need to make them, you know, make them uh, co to connect them and make them work. So I I would say that this outcome is whatever the citizens tell us that that it should be uh, but many of the elements could be policy orientations that citizens would prefer this or that but uh, eventually some very specific uh, elements will, will will come out for instance i've heard in, in one of the meetings with citizens someone saying a very concrete measure we need to have hospitals that are uh, being uh, uh, assessed with the quality level at European Union level, for instance. We need to have a like a quality certificate at European level for hospitals. Okay, this is a very specific measure that could be presented. Um, and some would be more uh, kind of orientation or, uh, or a, a special line. Then, uh, some people say, for instance, Europe Day should be a holiday. A holiday where we discuss, this is the day to celebrate Europe and to discuss Europe. Okay, that's a very concrete proposal too. <laughs> Let's see if, if it passes or not. And all this will be in the report that uh, uh, the executive board have to write and present to the three presidents of the conference. Thank you very much. Um, if I understand you correctly, um, you are saying that one of the uh, benefits of the conference will be to raise awareness among European citizens, uh, first of all, of the issues that are facing Europe, and secondly, of what is being done uh, to address those issues. And thirdly, perhaps, as you said, to tease out uh, the limits and the complexities of the various solutions uh, that are being advanced for those problems. So, so raising awareness and perhaps uh, encouraging people to participate more, uh, those could very well be valid and useful outcomes of the conference. Absolutely, I, I agree 100%, because we have tried first uh, with the uh, citizens dialogues to do this. Uh, this goes a bit further down because it, it brings people to the difficulties and to the challenges of decision making. Um, one thing, and to do that, people have to understand the complexity of the, of the system that we have, the complexity of the policies, and also the relevance of the European Union and what we are doing, because sometimes people are not aware. That I, some, when I talk to people, sometimes I say, um, if, uh, if we were to paint blue, everything that in this room is connected with the European Union, we would certainly have not just a blue flag out there, we will have a blue room because mm -hmm. we're talking about quality of the air, uh, quality of the water. We are talking about the, uh, the, um, the elements uh, of our, the, the 
efficiency of lamps of uh, you know elements that are connected with the uh, with the paint that we have on the doors and uh, if it's safe or not for children uh, so all all these elements uh, are uh, um, brussels uh, policies or brussels decided so i think a lot of people do not uh, uh, do not have that perspective and it is important to raise uh, their awareness on this also yeah Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of questions on uh, technical aspects of the procedures for the conference. Uh, the first is about the, uh, the conference plenary. Um, the, I think this should adopt its conclusions by consensus. Uh, but if there is a vote, if that becomes necessary on the final report of the conference, um, will all members of the plenary have voting rights? or will it only be the members of the institutions and the national governments? That is, that is a very, uh, very important uh, question because so far conclusions are to be taken by consensus. And, uh, and this is very relevant because uh, in principle, we are not, there shouldn't be any vote. The decisions should be taken by consensus and uh, if in the end there are different opinions, those different opinions should be uh, presented as such uh, in the report. They should be identified and say there is option one supported by Tata and option B supported by. And, uh, and so these uh, different uh, possibilities should be, uh, should be present in the report. Um, uh, and uh, as much as possible, avoiding uh, to vote. Uh, the idea is to, to proceed with the debates, with the discussions, and, uh, and then uh, take all these elements uh, into, this, uh, into this final report. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the conference is taking place against the background of the COVID pandemic, um, which has not gone away and indeed in some countries is showing signs um, of, of resurging. So has any thought been given to how to manage uh, the conduct of the conference in the event that further restrictions on uh, meetings or interactions between people become necessary as a result of the pandemic? Um, in terms of the, the conference itself, so we had the, the first plenary, which was an hybrid format. Um, there were, um, I think, um, 100 and something people uh, present physically in Strasbourg, and uh, the others were online, and it worked very well. Uh, now for the next plenaries, we hope that uh, they can be done already physically in the big uh, meeting room of the of, of the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Um, we are talking about a set of more or less 400 people uh, and the, the room is uh, for, uh, has been uh, set for 750. So there's, there's, there is space uh, enough, um, but at the same time, I think we need to allow, uh, to continue to allow for a hybrid uh, format. For the panels, uh, for the, the citizens panels, as I said, uh, so far, uh, what is scheduled is that a first uh, block uh, will be uh, physical, if possible, uh, 200, 200, uh, 200 and 200. So uh, the 800 people divided into four groups. Uh, and, then, uh, and then to have uh, the second session will be online, exclusively online. And then the third session of the panels uh, will be uh, again uh, physically where they have to write down a set of proposals in the different in the different areas. So let, let's hope that uh, this uh, can be this can be done. Um, at, at the end of this, the um, we hope to have also a, a final event with this 800 citizens to give them feedback about. Uh, what happened to their proposals? Because I think this is very important. We cannot just listen to people. We need to listen and then tell them what what have you done with what what have we done with their proposals. So uh, at a certain point, we have to 
to give them feedback and say, well, we've listened to you. This proposal was presented to the plenary. The plenary decided this way or that way, and it will find its way into the final report or not. So we will have to get back to people. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from a, a friend and former colleague of mine, Anne Barrington, um, who recalls what you said to the IIEA the last time you spoke about a Europe in transition and about inequalities leading to a questioning of democratic processes. Um, across Europe and Ireland in particular, unequal access to social and affordable housing is feeding into the perception and the realities of inequalities. Um, so her question is, in what way could the Conference on the Future of Europe assist in ensuring that access to decent housing is a principle in the Charter of Fundamental Rights and interpretations of state aid rules should not overrule the rights of member states to determine their own housing regimes um, as a service of general economic interest. Yeah, well, this, this, uh, the, this, this is a big, a big thing because uh, I, during the Portuguese presidency, we thought that the social issues uh, were central, uh, not only because of the pandemic, uh, since we know that a lot of people lost their jobs, uh, the enterprises were, were uh, you know, losing their capital and, uh, and, and, and quitting. And, and, and we saw that the most vulnerable ones were the first to lose jobs and women and migrants and uh, uh, people with disabilities. And, uh, and then we had the, the situation of our elderly people that were the most affected by the crisis itself, particularly those that were leaving in, in, uh, in, in um, in the context of uh, homes or care homes. So we, we brought in the social aspect uh, in our presidency to the heart of the presidency to discuss this matter. Uh, and we did this because of the pandemic, but also looking towards the future. Because if we are going to have a, as we say, a more sustainable and, and more uh, innovative or a digital uh, future, these are immense opportunities, but they will also entail uh, some challenges. People will probably lose their job because the factory that was called operated will close. And what will happen to my job? What will happen to my family? Um, and uh, what will happen in the factory uh, where I, my job has been taken, you know, by automation? So this we need to give trust and confidence to the people that we're taking care of them, uh, not only promoting the creation of new jobs and better jobs, but also doing the skilling and reskilling of people so that they can you know, face with more confidence these cha uh, challenges and fight uh, against poverty, particularly children's poverty. And at the same time, the element of housing is, is another one that come, comes into here. During our presidency, we were not able to discuss the issue of housing. A lot of member states said, no, this is national policy. And uh, it's, not, it's not easy. So, um, and this is one of the elements that uh, has to probably will be asked to be addressed by many citizens. Uh, particularly also young people that do not have uh, access to affordable housing. So if this comes in, we need to address it. Uh, and social policies, in the event that we organized in Portugal on the 17th of June uh, with European citizens, this was one of the elements, the social came back and forward. And the housing also uh, was brought in by a young lady who said, I, I'm living at my parents, I, I cannot afford a house anymore. Uh, we cannot, I cannot. So um, this is, uh, and, and then there is also the issue of integration of migrants 
and how do we support this integration and, and how do we bring also uh, decent work and decent housing for these people. So I, I'm sure that these elements will be brought uh, by the citizens to the debate. Uh, and then uh, the thing is, if the report already presents some ideas for solution or not, because this is another issue. The report can say, okay, we have identified a problem with housing in Europe. How do we treat this? How should we treat this? So if there are already some ideas for solutions, then it's easier. If not, then it will be just uh, bringing in demands and problems. Yeah. So this report, the final report, will be a fundamental document. So do you think that the conference could lead to greater demands for social issues like housing and perhaps um, the resettlement of migrants being dealt with at the national level or the local level rather than having a, a, a scheme prescribed at European level for everybody? It could be in that direction, but it also could be in the sense that uh, European money should be used for that in the sense that we now have the recovery plans and we have the European budget. So um, affordable housing should be one element that is not concretely mentioned. Uh, so I, I, I do not want to preclude what the citizens will ask. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that some of them will say, leave this to the local level. I don't want the union to interfere. Others will say, we need a European solution for this. Uh, we need to have a, a possibility of having young people traveling around and, and having not just give them the opportunity of traveling, but give them the opportunity of leaving in, a, in another country and having the right uh, affordable housing. Um, so we, we need to see what do the citizens bring, uh, bring us on, 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 these, on these elements. And, it, it's very interesting because when you open this box, you don't know what will come out of it. It was very interesting to have, we had a citizen uh, from Cyprus talking about the need of a, un a union that is, it, that, that is built on values, but more on that, more than that, he was talking about a certain spiri spirituality that is needed. Um, some people will say, oh, this is not what we need to talk about. But for others, this is important also. It's not just, it's the values, it's very important, but he was mentioning this kind of in a philosophical way uh, that we need to go back to the principles, to the basic principles. And, and I think this is, this is interesting. We, we never know what, pre, what people will bring about. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Um, and it brings me to another question, which is, about the role or for faith-based organizations in the conference. There is, as you know, under Article 17 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, provision for an ongoing consultation between the Commission and uh, religions and philosophical organizations. And uh, I wonder if, um, based on your experience so far, you think that those organizations could make a useful input to the conference on the future of Europe. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Neri, for that question too, because there, there was a, a, a big discussion about it uh, uh, when we were discussing the rules of procedure and, uh, and how could we better integrate this dimension. And at a certain moment, we said that, okay, let's decide that uh, one of the eight uh, representatives of the civil society will be a representative of um, uh, people with disabilities. And uh, at least the other one should be a representative of the religions and philosoph philosophic organizations. And, uh, and then a big uh, discussion came about because uh, the idea is it's very difficult to have one, one representative. And, and uh, we, we were counting the different uh, organizations, uh, even in when they 
built some sort of associations of federations of organizations and we had at least i think 25 and um, and so uh, the the decision was taken that uh, we do not say anything about it. it's up to the civil society to organize themselves and see who they send as representatives to the plenary if even if they want to do kind of a rotation uh to because they ate so mm. there are thousands so uh, it could be a good thing to have a rotation um but uh, it would be important for the members of the executive board to meet with the representatives of the um of the religion and philosophic uh, organizations to uh, to have their input their direct input and if they produce a report we need to take it into, into consideration i think it would be uh, most appropriate that uh, we listen also to that segment of of uh, of, uh, of of the population yeah. okay thank you very much um we have a question from Ali, from Ross Fitzpatrick, who's a researcher at the Institute, about the uh, the outcome of the conference and to what extent it's likely that that will involve treaty change. Um, given that there are a number of member states who are very hesitant about treaty change, how likely do you think it is um, that it will be possible to achieve agreement on treaty change um, at this stage? That, that is also another very uh, complex uh, question, because um, I think the basic line is, let's talk about policies. Let's talk about policies. Let's talk about what people uh, want uh, in terms of things that affect their daily life. I, 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 I don't think that a lot of people want to engage in the discussion about spits and candidate and, and, uh, and about things like that, uh, though imp as important as they might be. So I, I think it's important to listen to what people want and if what they want means that we need to change the treaty, then we will get to it. But um, the basic idea is we do not exclude. Uh, it's not a taboo. Uh, it's not a taboo. We can talk about it, but in a, in a, in a, I would say in a logic order. Uh, when we start listening to people, they say we want um, more health. We want a European health policy, really centered with this new organization era and uh, with uh, the organizations that deal with health. It's not just for the pandemics, it's for cancer research, it's for uh, um, you know, other elements of uh, public health. And, and there uh, we need to see, do the Lisbon Treaty has the needed flexibility? So far we found it that it's okay. We have already a new program for health, and we didn't change the treaty and things worked quite well. So, but if people want more, maybe we need to change something. Other people, uh, you know, in, in these conversations, there is a lot coming up, people saying, it takes a long time for the European Union to take decisions, far too long. Uh, we cannot wait for a decision for months and months, sometimes years. When the decision is taken, reality has already overcome the, the decision that the European Union is taking. So you need to change, you need to change, or you need either to change this um, uh, consensus decision and, and have qualified majority. Others say, oh no, you need to find um, ways of, uh, in which people can work in different uh, uh, partnerships like we did for Schengen or like we did for the Euro. Not everybody has to be on board. Uh, everybody has to have the same opportunities and, and, and adhere to these partnerships uh, if they want. But you know, these are ideas. People are, 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 are showing ways. Um, and I think the European Parliament uh, in many ways has very clear ideas also uh, when they discuss and they debate this. Uh, so, Treaty changes, maybe, I don't know. It depends on what comes from the people, I would say. Um, and Alexander Conway, another researcher at the Institute, 
asks about the, um, the cultural issue, which is that um, citizens of 27 different countries are going to engage with each other in the framework of this conference. They come from very different historical traditions, uh, from countries with different economic situations and uh, so on. Um, how easy will it be, do you think, uh, based on your experience, to bring about a consensus between people from these very different and varied uh, cultural contexts? Uh, that's, that's not going to be easy, but that's who we are. That's building a European culture. Uh, it's this famous motto that we should never forget, united in diversity. And uh, the more we meet in these ways, the more people understand each other, um, the more people understand what, this, what are the other's cultural background, uh, I, I think the more we can build a European culture, a European identity. Um, it's easy? No, it's not easy. Uh, but I, I think, from, I think it's my, my perspective that the more we do this, uh, the better a union we will build. <laughs> because this means that we are able to listen to others, to listen to the others' expectations, and to understand. And to understand, I think it is fundamental. At the moment when we see the social networks, uh, where people express such a, you know, sentiments of hate and then then distress and uh, and uh, it's my voice, it's my opinion, not yours. You are not right. I am right. The more we open the possibility for people really to interact in an open in an open way, uh, listening really to each other, I think that that's the best way that we can have to build uh, the future of Europe. And if we can do this with 800 citizens, I think this, this will be very interesting. It's a unique experience that we are opening up. If this works, we can do more and more of this because this is another issue. Will the conference die on, on April 22? Or this will be the first chapter? I, I don't know. I, I think nobody really knows. We all know as members of the executive board that, that we there has to be prepared, a report has to be prepared, has to be sent to the leaders, they have to act. Uh, but will the process stop? I, I, that, that's another conclusion that should be a conclusion from the conference itself. Yeah. Well, that's a very inspiring note on, on which to, to end our discussion. And I'm afraid that time is against us and we have to bring this session to a close. Uh, you've been very generous with your time, Secretary Zacharias, and we're very grateful to you for sharing your insights into the conference and the future of Europe with us. You've given us a lot of very valuable information, and I hope that it will encourage people to engage with the conference and to ensure that their voice is heard. So once again, Secretary Zacharias, thank you very much for addressing us today and responding to our questions. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and joined in the discussion. And a big thank you as well to the staff of the IIEA who organized this event. So thank you all and goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>